Some thought that MCC needed to become more centralized in order to survive, while others said the group should disband and let the natural course of events determine the survival of the houses. Many thought the latter option would be suicide, and it probably would have been. Instead of disbanding, MCC chose to become more centralized. Each house would have one board representative, and reps would be sent to the other committees. A maintenance pool with a budget and a plan would also be set up, though it remained small. By 1976, MCC had lost Solvig Co-op, and Stone Manor was on the verge of collapse due to debt and apathy of its members, and MCC was considering selling it. Offers had been made by a fraternity, but finally MCC decided to just restart the house, and they changed its name to Martha's Co-op. This same year, the Langdon Area Grocery Co-op was started in the lower level of Tralfamador to serve the Langdon neighborhood. late 70s and early 80s were a period of overall decline in the Madison Co-op movement. MCC continued to evolve and become more focused on its owned houses as co-ops such as Rochdale International, New Wine, Summit, Nottingham, International, and Rivendell left the coalition because they felt they no longer needed to be part of a larger organization. Many of the business co-ops were folding and even the underground newspaper Free For All that had always been a voice for the radical political movement in Madison, went under. But the co-ops weren't going under simply because of changing political winds, or even because of disco. They were going under because of poor management. Some co-ops were thriving and some were being formed while others were folding. Housing co-ops were vulnerable to poor management too. The natural cycle of culture in houses could bring golden ages or dark ages, and it was during dark ages that the co-ops were most vulnerable to collapse. Independent houses had a tougher time making it through these periods than MCC. Co-ops are run by the people in them, and if everyone's jumping ship, there will be no one left to steer. If a Paul fell over an MCC house, the other healthy co-ops in the groups would step in to help it out financially or with reorganization. In 1979, MCC got the funds together to buy Friends Co-op at the request of their members, and it became MCC's fifth owned house. The next year, Grove's Women's Co-op was in the midst of a dark age, and with only seven members left and mounting debt and maintenance problems, they appealed to MCC to buy their house. MCC did so, paid off their debt, and restarted the house. I went through a divorce in about 1982, I think it was, and I was just at lo I was at a loss about what to do, and I ran into some people that I became friends with, and they said, "Man, you got to get into housing co-ops," and they took me over to Nottingham Housing Co-op, and I just thought it was the answer to all my dreams because I was really lonely and I was sad and I was I just had to start over and I didn't know what to do, and so. There was this whole group of people that wanted to be my friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was like four of them who membership from the cult, from the fraternity that prior to Nottingham buying the building, owned the building. Highland Five. Highland Five. Yeah. And I used to go over there all the time down the street where that co-op or where that fraternity was, and I saw a couple of them sitting on the front porch. So we investigated. <laughs> and we discovered that they were all members of the fraternity. We had openings in the house and they all came over and hung out and membershiped and yeah. And they said that it didn't mean anything, but I can't remember if it was after we busted them and they moved or if it was right before that that somebody came in and stole the whole barn and then eventually they brought it back to us. I was at the Green Lantern for um, Halloween 
and I saw the sky. There's a big Halloween party there. I saw the sky. Well, I'd seen earlier on State Street. This is one of those Halloweens where it's like 30 degrees out and raining and just horrible. This guy on State Street had on um, a bicycle sprocket and some um, re reflectors on his cheeks, his butt cheeks, and he had um, uh, earrings made out of handlebar dangly things. And, um, and that's all I had on, and <laughs> I was thinking, God, I got some freezing. The night after the big Thanksgiving party, I went to the house, and that naked guy answered the phone, I mean, uh, answered the door, let me in, he was really bizarre, his name's Claude Van Der Veen. And, uh, and, but I, you know, immediately liked him, he was a really neat guy. And then um, Steve Tiffany had warmed up all the leftovers from Thanksgiving dinner, um, there's a big Thanksgiving Wednesday dinner, and, uh, and it was the best food that I've ever eaten. And it was just, you know, it was like peanut soup and all these weird concoctions that people put together that were just, you know, all homemade and really, really good. And that was it for me. I was sold. I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to live there. Right? The women in the house were really powerful. They were all very strong people. And we would, well, I remember we uh, developed kind of a craft club that would meet on a regular basis. And it would be mostly women, but some men would come as well. And just had the opportunity to come together and um, and just not only talk about political issues but also relish the fact that we're women and we like to do some kinds of things as well. And there were a lot of activities where the women would go off and do things together as a group and um, I don't think that it was necessarily intentional that we were empowering each other but having the opportunity to just be together as women, I think, really made us feel a strength. In the early 80s, after adopting an expansion policy to buy more houses on the Near East Side, MCC bought 812 Jennifer to start the eight-member Centropy Co-op. The house was able to get around zoning occupancy regulations only because it was grandfathered in as a boarding house. Ronald Reagan's conservative politics were having a great impact on the country and were trickling down on the co-op movement. The housing co-ops, however, remained stable and healthy, proving that they were now viable, independent of political and economic trends. The five-member Black Walnut Co-op was started by ex-MCC members who wanted to prove that an independent co-op could be started without the help of a larger organization. After much difficulty with city officials over zoning laws and paranoia of the Rutledge Street neighborhood, who were under the impression that the house was to be a home for juvenile delinquents, they were finally able to move in in 1985. 